Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 36. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. But when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. Because for this purpose I've come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. This is, of course, at the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And Mark's Gospel is filled with so much immediate action. The way Mark presents the life of Jesus, Jesus is busy doing one thing and another thing. One of the frequently reoccurring words in the Gospel of Mark is immediately. Because Jesus is just a very busy Savior in the Gospel of Mark. Well, as a busy Savior, Jesus is out healing, he's out ministering to people, and then he can't do that without the equipping he needs in prayer. So in verse 35, which is the verse right before where I started reading, it spoke about Jesus going out to a solitary place and praying. And the disciples, this is fairly new in their discipleship, that they hadn't been with Jesus that long, because if they had been with him a little longer, they would have just known, if you don't know where Jesus is, he's off praying somewhere. But this time they didn't know. Early in their discipleship with Jesus, where is he? They find him praying. They searched for him, verse 36. They say to him, verse 37, everyone is looking for you. By the way, I, I, I kind of have it in my mind that they thought that Jesus would be very pleased by that. Oh, wow, look, I'm, I'm getting a lot of visibility. You know, I'm getting a lot of followers, a lot of likes. Wow, I'm popular. You know, it just really didn't concern Jesus, did it? No, what Jesus was concerned with was the relationship he had with his father. But he also had to be about his father's business. That's why he says in verse 38, let us go into the next towns. Jesus didn't just stay where he was and sort of ride the swell of his popularity. He goes, no, there's work for us to do. Let's go to other towns. Let's preach in other places. Jesus' ministry was not focused on being famous, and his ministry was not focused on enjoying his fame. No, he says, this purpose is why he came forth. It's to preach, to teach, to announce the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus was doing from place to place. Now, in the midst of all of that, while Jesus is giving attention to that, look what happens now, starting at verse 40. Now, a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What a scene, isn't it? I mean, the word that we read it, we understand it, but we only understand it from a distance is that word leper. The man who came, implored to Jesus, knelt down before him and said to him, if you're willing, you can make me clean. This man was a leper. Now, according to some statistics I looked up a few years ago, they say that there's about 15 million people across the world who are afflicted with what we call leprosy. But by the way, Leprosy, especially as it's defined in the Old Testament, is a broader range of skin diseases than other than just what we kind of technically call leprosy today. But what we call technically leprosy today, there's about 15 million people who suffer. And they've, they've got medications for it today. They've got ways to help people. But in the ancient world, they had nothing. You know, leprosy begins as little red spots on the skin. And then those little red spots start to get a little bigger and bigger. And then they start to turn white. They get kind of a shiny or scaly appearance. Then those spots start appearing all over your body. And then the next step is your hair starts to fall off. I see some of us are already afflicted with that. <laughs> your hair starts to fall out first from your head. But then, even from like your eyebrows, as things get worse, your fingernails and your toenails start to become very loose on your digits and just start falling off. Then the joints of your fingers and toes begin to rot and fall off piece by piece. 
your gums begin to shrink and recede and your teeth fall out, again, one by one. Leprosy will keep eating away at the face until the nose, the palate of your mouth, and even your eyes rot out. You you can see why leprosy was so horrific in the ancient world. In the ancient world, a leper was considered to be a walking dead person. Because even though it took time to reach that advanced, horrific stage, everybody knew that a leper was on their way to that stage. It, It just didn't get better. Now, the physical suffering of leprosy was terrible, but but there was a whole additional dimension of the suffering, which, again, it makes sense, especially in the ancient world. It was the way other people treated you. I mean, we talk about people today being treated as a leper. Well, that saying comes from a place. In the Old Testament, God said that when there were lepers among the children of Israel, that they had to be examined and quarantined. And then by custom, lepers would dress like people who were in mourning for the dead because they were considered to be the living dead. By tradition, again, this isn't so much in the Bible, but by tradition, lepers would walk around in ancient Jewish culture and they would have to cry out, unclean, unclean, anytime they saw a person come near them. Because not only was it thought to be contagious, but it was also breaking of the Old Testament ceremonial law. God used leprosy as a striking example of sin and its effects upon us. Now, as happens so often, the Jewish people in the Old Testament, I'm not saying this happens so often with the Jewish people, it happens so often with everybody. We have a tendency to take what God says and go further with it. We're not content just to do what God says. So they say, well, God tells us to do these things for the lepers, quarantine them, you know, make sure that they're not contagious and, and spreading any disease to anybody else, understand it as a, as a picture of what sin does to a person. That There's all of that. But then there were some in the Jewish community through the centuries that, that would add additional punishments to lepers. You see, they thought two things about a leper in that day. Number one, they said, you are the walking dead. And the second thing they thought about a leper was to say, you deserve it. The judgment of God must be upon you. So lepers were absolutely reviled in the ancient world. By tradition, you would not even speak to a leper at all. You would would not even greet them. You had to stay six feet away from a leper. One rabbi used to brag that he wouldn't even buy an egg on a street if there was a leper on that street. And then another rabbi boasted that whenever he saw a leper, he started throwing rocks at him to keep him far from him. Another rabbi said he wouldn't allow a leper to even wash his own face. So friends, there was the physical dimension of this disease. There was the cultural dimension There's a psychological dimension. Can you get inside the mind of this man who came to Jesus, did you see verse 40? Imploring him. That's another word you can use for begging. Now, by the way, he's drawing near to Jesus, I think closer than the six-foot radius. I don't know if he's touching Jesus, probably not. He's keeping some distance, but not the accepted distance imploring Jesus, begging him, kneeling before Jesus. And then this is what he says, verse 40, it's astounding words. You can make me clean. Look, the one thing you got to understand about leprosy is that there was no cure for it. None. That's just it. Nobody was cured from leprosy. And so the leper really believed in the power of Jesus. He really believed that Jesus could heal him. 
this shows that this leper understood that Jesus was the Messiah. And listen, as far as we know, to this point in his ministry, Jesus had not healed a leper. Again, we don't know all the ministry of Jesus. Do you remember what, Jesus, what John says at the end of his gospel? That if we were to write down everything that Jesus said or did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it. But, but I'm just saying there's no recorded instance of Jesus healing a leper to this point. Maybe he had never done it before. And it's not because he wasn't able, but he just never been faced with the situation in his ministry. But now he was. And I just imagine this leper saying, listen, I don't know if he's ever done it before, but I believe this man's the Messiah. The Messiah has power over my disease. So please, I believe that you could make me clean. Now, the word clean there kind of in, in context means whole, means heal. But, but there's also a sense, do you see what the leper's saying? He doesn't just feel diseased, but he feels unclean. I'm filthy. I'm a reject. I, I don't just need to be physically healed. You got to make me clean. Isn't it really strange among human beings, and I mean strange in a super tragic way, that human beings have the ability to not feel guilty over things that they should feel guilty about. Don't raise your hand or anything. But then we also have the capability of feeling guilty about things that we shouldn't feel guilty about at all. And I just sense some of this in this leper. I must be an especially horrible person, hated by God, because God has afflicted me with this. And if you or I were to sit down and have a cup of coffee with this leper, and we try to talk him out of that and try to make him understand, but you can just catch the emotive power of it. He implored Jesus, kneeled before him, I believe you can make me clean. All right, now verse 41. Then Jesus moved with compassion. Man, we could just preach on that sentence, couldn't we? The great compassion of Jesus. When's the last time you think this leper got any kind of compassion from anybody? But our Savior is so great. He's so filled with love. He's moved with compassion he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I'm willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. You know, Jesus, so filled with compassion. And by the way, I like how Luke records this incident. It's in Luke chapter 5. Luke, being a physician, he adds this detail, that the man was full of leprosy. Jesus moved it. Now, You probably feel sorry for sick people, don't you? You see people who are suffering or in some kind of illness or chronic condition. But I want you to understand how different lepers were. Whatever it was in that culture, the normal compassion that might arise from somebody towards somebody who's sick or, or injured that same compassion did not normally arise towards lepers in those days. But Jesus was different. Jesus has a compassion, a love that goes beyond what, what mere men and women have. M most people thought of lepers as just being too repulsive. The, the feeling you would have at looking at somebody who had leprosy, especially, as Luke says, a man who was full of leprosy, You'd be disgusted. 
not moved with compassion. But Jesus moved by compassion. Did you see what he did in verse 41? He stretched out his hand and touched him. Friends, there's so much just in that one line in verse 41. Now, when you think about the healing ministry of Jesus, he healed in so many ways. I think Pastor Tommy made reference to this on on Sunday. The, The many different ways that Jesus healed people. Sometimes he just spoke a word. Sometimes he uh, spit in the ground and made mud and put it in their eyes and then told them something unnecessary. Hey, go ahead and wash that out. Uh, sometimes Jesus uh, did all sorts of different things in healing people. Here, in a very deliberate action, he stretched forth the man and touched him. Whoa, Jesus. You just broke the rules. Because what are you not allowed to do? You're not allowed to touch a leper. The leper is unclean. And if you are ceremonially clean, you touch something that's unclean or someone that's unclean, what happens to you? You become unclean. Jesus, you just broke the rules. You just touched that leper. But you know what Jesus did that was so brilliant? He destroyed the evidence of his wrongdoing. Jesus could immediately say, what leper? I didn't touch any leper. Show me the leper. I don't see a leper. It's funny to think about in those terms, but there's something very important and serious here. When the unclean come into contact with Jesus, he isn't in by their uncleanness. His cleanness is given over to them. Isn't that powerful? Now this would become ultimately true at the cross. Where you could say all the uncleanness of humanity was poured out upon Jesus in a way that goes beyond our comprehension. And it could really only happen because he was the God-man Truly man, but also truly God, and therefore has the capability for the infinite. But all the sin, all the shame, all the degradation, all the wrath, all of it, he satisfied it perfectly on the cross. And when all that uncleanness was poured upon him, notice friends, it didn't make Jesus unclean. Matter of fact, his resurrection was proof that it did not make him unclean. Because as Peter says later on in Acts chapter 2, that God says in the scriptures, he will not allow his holy one to see decay. Jesus was raised from the dead, giving proof that he was God's holy one, meaning that he was not made unclean by whatever was put upon him on the cross. He bore the curse. He bore the shame. He bore the sin. He bore it all. And in this unbelievable demonstration of the love of God and the power of God, he triumphed over all of it. And he makes those who come to him clean instead of himself becoming unclean. He reached out his hand. And I just imagine what it felt like for that man to have a loving, compassionate hand put on his arm, put on his shoulder, put on his head. I don't know where Jesus touched him. He touched him. And it says, immediately he was healed. That which is impossible with man is possible with God. And with man, it's absolutely impossible, in the ancient world speaking, to heal a person from leprosy. Oh, but Jesus accomplished it with just a touch. Now, did you notice what Jesus told the man there? It says there in verse Uh, 42, as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed and he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. Do you see that in verse 43? Pretty strong there, isn't it? Strictly warned him. Hey, Mr. Former Leper, look, I need to talk to you now. I'm telling you something really serious. Are you listening to me? You You know, Mr. Leper is just, Mr. Former Leper is just so excited. 
You can imagine, just he's beside himself. Jesus, are you listening to me? I need to warn you about something. Verse 44, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Look, I've just changed your life. You've received my power. I've healed you. You're cleansed. You're not just healed, you're cleansed. Okay, so this one, number one, don't tell anybody. Number two, go to the priest. Now, this stuff took place in Galilee. The guy had to go to Jerusalem to go to the priests and and to do the ceremonies that he was supposed to do. So Jesus says, listen, you got to start on this journey. Don't tell anybody. Go to the priest and do it to him as a testimony. Do, Do you know what the ceremony for the cleansing of a priest was all about, cleansing of a priest, cleansing of a leper was all about? It's in Leviticus chapter 14. Turn there, if you will. I'm going to read you verses 4 through 7 of Leviticus chapter 14. Ready? Then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them in the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean and let the living bird loose in the open field. Hallelujah. You you go, what? You read this and you think the only thing missing is like an eye of newt somewhere in there. What what is this ceremony? What is it telling him to do? Well, friends, this is the law of God. This is good. This is right. This is just. Let's understand it. Okay, when a leper's cleansed, this is what you got to do. You got to take two living and clean birds. Next, some cedar wood, a little plank or a little stick. Scarlet, now some people think this was a piece of cloth, other people think it was a piece of yarn or like string, and hyssop. This is what you're going to do. So, you take these two birds, and what do you do? Well, the priest would perform this ceremony outside the camp, because that's where he met the leper. That's contained in verse 3 of Leviticus chapter 14. And there's no mention of the tabernacle anywhere here. So this would happen outside the camp. The the, the priest would bring his little uh, leper cleansing kit with him, you know, and uh, take it outside the camp, take the cedar wood, highly resistant to disease and rot, uh, scarlet here, yarn, maybe cloth, hyssop used for the sprinkling of blood or water, then this is what you do. You, take, you, you need some kind of a clay pot, too. We might call it a bowl. And you also need some water in this ritual. So the first bird is killed in a clay bowl, an earthen vessel, that also contains water from a spring, a creek, or a river. Running water, verse 5 is how it's described. And you would probably break the bird's neck and drain out some of its blood in the water in the bowl. Kind of gross, but that's just what you do. You know, this is all very distant to us, but all these folks, they grew up on a farm, the equivalent. Okay, you just break the bird's neck, drain out its blood, mix it in with the water. So you got this water and blood mixture right there in the bowl. Then you take the other bird, and we're not exactly sure about this. Some rabbis think that what you do is you take the bird and put the cedar wood and the hyssop like on its back and then wind the yarn around it and make kind of on a stick, kind of like a bird on a stick almost thing. It sounds a little weird, but we don't know exactly how it worked. And then you would dip that bird in the bloody water in the bowl. You take it out and then you shake it at or towards or on the leper and he would be cleansed. You, you just sh- There's no given of a prescription of a prayer to pray, anything like that. You just take that bird, you, you wet it, Feathers are all wet. Shake it. Bird on a stick. You shake it. The the blood mixed with water gets on the leper 
or at least towards him, probably on him. And then you carefully unwrap the bird, the living bird, and you let him go out in the field. Oh, and you do it, by the way, verse 7 says seven times. Sprinkle it seven times. And then let the bird loose in the open field. That's verse 7. Now, here's the thing to understand. Lepers were never healed. Okay, I'm thinking of the one example I can think of of a healed leper in the Old Testament. Pastor Bobby, is there only one? I'm thinking of Naaman. Okay, Naaman. And he wasn't even an Israelite. So he wouldn't have gone to the priest for this. Naaman was a Syrian or something, wasn't he? The, the only, there's only one leper healed in the Old Testament that we know of. And he was a Gentile, not a Jew. He wouldn't even, this ceremony, as far as we know, was never used. Never. I mean, it's in God's law, of course. But if there were no healed lepers in Israel, it was never used. But it's in there. So think about what a testimony it would have been for this healed leper to go, hey, priest, I'm healed of my leprosy. No, for real, I really am. And they'd go, we've never done this ceremony. Blow the dust off of that scroll and let's figure this out because we've never done this ceremony before. And if you think about it, this is what they would do. They would go outside the camp. In ancient Israel, they would probably go outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Outside the camp, away from the normal conduct of the system of sacrifice, they're a living being from the heavens, birds are of the heavens. A living thing of the heavens is going to be sacrificed in an earthen vessel. But even as the bird is killed, it's going to be cleansed by the running water. And then the death associated with water and blood will be applied to the leper, and it'll be applied perfectly seven times, seven sprinkles, in connection with a living bird then the sacrificial blood is also going to be applied to scarlet yarn and a piece of wood together with hyssop. And bearing the mark of sacrifice, the living bird is going to fly away, ascending to the heavens and out of sight. Friends, do you realize this unusual ritual points so powerfully to the person and work of Jesus Christ? Jesus was sacrificed outside the camp. Jesus was the man from heaven. Jesus remained cleansed and holy even in his death, becoming sin, as 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, without becoming a sinner. Jesus came by water and blood and died in association with blood and water. You remember when the Roman soldier pierced his side. Jesus died in association with a scarlet cloth he was clothed with that mob that they ro- robe what they ro- mocked him with. He died in association with wood being uh, uh, nailed to a cross. He died in association with hyssop as they lifted up a hyssop branch from to drink with sponge. He di- he lived, but yet bearing the marks of his death, and he ascended to heaven out of human sight. Okay, now you see. How the living bird points not only to the resurrected Jesus, but in a secondary symbolism, the living bird also points to the one who's healed and free from their leprosy. Because those who are resurrected are resurrected after the pattern of Jesus Christ. All right, now back to Mark chapter 1. Let me start reading at verse 43 again. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. I want you to be a testimony to the priests. Verse 45. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely. And to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Look, the former leper no doubt 
meant well. He probably thought he was helping Jesus. But in a sense, you've got to give me some latitude on this. In a sense, his disobedience hindered the work of Jesus. Jesus didn't want the crowds to rise up in such a big sight. He would give them more freedom in ministry. But this man's disobedience swelled the crowds faster than Jesus had originally intended. And I say only in a sense because, look, in the big picture, nobody's hindering the work of Jesus. We understand that in the big picture. But in a limited sense, what this guy did hindered what Jesus wanted to do. Now, Jesus told this man, how to give his testimony. Shut up and show it to the priests. Isn't it interesting that first of all, the man did what Jesus told him not to. And look, I got to say, yes, the man was disobedient, but you and I, we kind of understand, don't we? How could you shut up about such great news like that? How could you not tell people? Okay, I'm a little more generous towards that. I mean, who cares what I think? But you just kind of, I understand it a little bit more. Jesus told him in verse 44, say nothing to anyone. But but it says in verse 45, he went out and began to proclaim it freely. Just, I got to tell everybody. Jesus said nobody, and he told everybody. So he did what Jesus told him not to do. But I want you to catch this. And to me, this is even more significant. That as far as the text tells us, he did not do what Jesus told him to do. What did Jesus tell him to do? Go to the priests. That's your testimony. And there's no evidence here that the guy did it. Instead, he just said, well, I'll I'll do it my way. No, this is great. Doesn't matter if I tell the priest, I'll just tell anybody. So he did what Jesus told him not to do, and he didn't do what Jesus told him to do. Thank you. This man's failure to obey Jesus, both in what he did and what he did not do, in some sense, I want to emphasize that, in some sense, hindered the ministry of Jesus. As it says there in verse 45, Jesus could no longer enter the city. Folks, that's star power. You can't even enter the city because people are crowding around you so much. Now, Jesus had a specific reason why he told the man, don't tell it about, but do tell the priests. And I'll be honest with you, I I don't see how those reasons probably apply to us much today. But I mean, you can pretty much count on it. If Jesus does something amazing in your life, He probably wants other people to hear about it. I I think that part of the advice to the man was kind of a one-off for this specific situation. But yet, he, he didn't do what Jesus, or excuse me, he did do what Jesus told him not to. Normally, Jesus wants us to tell other people about the great things that he's done. But the the worst thing was that the testimony never got handed out to the priests the way that it should have. Now, look, God forbid that I'm kind of, you know, putting all this imagination in what Jesus did and everything. If I did that, I'd be the scriptwriter for the chosen. But, But it's as if Jesus is like saying this, look, I'm getting plenty of good press around here. People know me in Galilee. That's not a problem. But you know who really needs to hear about me? It's those priests in Jerusalem. That's who I really need to get a testimony. And Jesus is thinking, what an amazing testimony for them to have to blow the dust off of that scroll that contains Leviticus 14 because they've never done that ceremony in their lives and it's going to blow their mind. Also, the ritual of the ceremony is going to point to me and my work on humanity. It'll prepare them for what I'm about to do. So, When the guy did what Jesus told him to do, that wasn't good. But it is even worse that he did not do what Jesus told him to do. But let's just end with this thought. The best testimony is obedience to Jesus. 
Isn't that the best testimony? Now, if I were to look in the mirror and look at the guy who faces back at me in the mirror and say, hey, you, the best testimony is obedience to Jesus. Then I, I say, well, I don't always give the best testimony, do I? But this is what I know, that there's great forgiveness in Jesus. And maybe my testimony is how Jesus forgives and strengthens and restores even weak and failing people like me, like you. And he's our Savior. And, and I hope to obey him better. And with him working in my life, in your life, maybe together we can do some of that. That would be a pretty good testimony, don't you think? Father, that is our prayer. First of all, Lord, I, I pray... that to whatever sense we feel unclean, Lord, that we would just come and lay that before you, Jesus, and ask that you would cleanse us. And Lord, in the way that only you can do, I pray that you would extend forth your, your, your hand, so to speak, and touch anyone here, Lord, everyone here, who feels burdened by that sense of being unclean. Lord, I don't think there's anybody in this room that would have the diagnosis of leprosy. But Lord, our, our, our sin makes us unclean before you, but you came to cleanse us. And so Lord, we come to you in faith and we, we bow before you, we, we worship you, we kneel before you and we just say, Lord, I know you can make me clean. And so do it, Lord. And Father, just help us to give the best kind of testimony we can. And thank you, Lord, that all throughout your word, from Genesis to Revelation, you just write in so many ways and so many signs and so many symbols of the great and enduring work of Jesus Christ for us. We receive it. And we rejoice in it in Jesus' name.